checking out another Hampton Inn, getting ready to go help a landowner here in South Alabama. And it's cold down here. I think it got down in the 20s last night. But looking forward to looking at this property and creating a habitat and hunting improvement plan. Got a nice patch of pines. There are hundreds of sweet gum stems. Down where deer lives, it's wide open. I think you're 10 years away from spending five times as much money to set it back. Okay. It's not really. So we're here to create a plan that serves you. I'm just explaining the options. Yeah. I'm just really looking forward to watching it improve and grow. Yeah. See how wide all these roots are? Mm -hmm. This can be turned around quickly. Yeah. That is a beautiful comparison. The potential's here. Clearly the potential's here. And on certain mornings, those days you hunt it can be extremely productive. The wealth of knowledge that you bring to the table that helps me. Deer hungry. Deer are not going to make a good living off Japanese honeysuckle. Hard truth. That's my Christmas present. Just got to the property waiting for the landowner to show up and I enjoy working everywhere. I was in Minnesota last week, but in the South, deer hunting is just such a long-term tradition. We're in Alabama today and every property is unique. I know at the gate here, I see some bamboo on this side and real thick magnolias on this side. And this property has been cut over somewhat recently. So <clears throat> I'm gonna need to take all that in consideration. And we get the question a lot, can't we just do this off aerial images or satellite images? But man, when I see a big clear cut like out in front of us here, I need to put boots on the ground usually and see what species are in there to know the best course to redirect that to productive wildlife habitat. So we do some work where we help folks with satellite images or studying aerial photographs or whatever, but nothing beats boots on the ground so you can really see what's going on and make the best prescription to meet the landowner's objectives. Just met the landowner, Bobby, and driving in the property, getting a look at, you know, our canvas, what we're gonna paint on, what what plan are we gonna paint here? And before we fully make that plan, of course, we're gonna visit with Bobby and really dive into his goals and objectives. What's he see here five years from now? Or what's his goals? What's he wanna do? So there's not just a plan. The plan should be tailored to the landowner's goals and objectives, and of course, what we have to work with. Pines are so thick. Right. That uh, whoever, wherever we got the information from said, well, you're 10 years to harvest. That's probably true in a plantation setting where they're evenly spaced and not competing for resources as much. But because a lot of these are volunteer pine, when I look Almost out there, all of them, yeah. yeah, and you see four tops within 10 feet or something. Right. Those are not gonna mature like a plantation pine because there's so much competition. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And so I don't think we're looking at the yield you might be. And, and then in addition to that, you got a gazillion sweet gums and other hard species of hardwoods competing with that. Correct. Right next to it. I mean, not, you know, not pine here and a sweet gum here. And when I look out there, the hardwood tops are the same level as the pine tops. Right. With the occasional cedars thrown in and whatnot. Um, so I don't think you're 10 years away from a financial gain from harvest. I think okay. you're 10 years away from spending five times as much money to set it back. Okay. And then you've lost 10 years. Yes. That's just right off the bat. No, I'm we should have walked a mile and then I told you that, no, I think. But, no, I like it. Uh, uh, that, just from seeing and again, this. That's why I'm so thrilled you guys are here because if you talk to a timber guy, of course, he's going to tell you the timber stuff. And I just yeah. wanted. Well, we need to walk around more. I mean, again, yeah. that's my 30,000 looking out over the valley here. We need to dive in there and, you know, bust some briars and stuff. But when the previous owner or whatever chose to take the marketable timber off the majority of the property i would say right and then just leave it untreated well that's what you get is whatever seeds were growing so there's a pine seeds it was a pine harvest there's pine seeds always hardwood seeds and it's just really like right here you know i don't know 50 yards over here there are x hundred stems within 100 feet correct none, I know. none of those trees are ever going to be marketable Okay. They're too fighting for resources. They're intergrown, multi stems per stump. And does heavy burning help that at all? Or? They're too big. I mean, I'm okay. gonna say the base of these trees over here, probably about four or five inches of ground. These are four or five inches or more at the ground. It would take a catastrophic fire to set that back. 
Okay. And then it probably wouldn't kill it. It would just top kill it, and we'd get all these stump sprouts coming up. And now you're in a bigger mess. Right. I think early, early on in the day, but we're probably looking at a one-time herbicide application and then follow-up fire. And then I don't know exactly where you want, you know, the bird hunting that you mentioned being one of the passions in addition to other things and restoring native species. And where you're located, that all lends itself to lonely pine. Everything right. you've said so right. far. I know, and that was my initial reaction. Lends yeah. itself. And there is, uh, in addition to NRCS, there's some other sources for lonely pine funding. Right, Longleaf Alliance yes. and some other folks. You're way ahead of You're way ahead. Really? This is going to be a great day. You have a lot of knowledge already. Uh -huh. So I think early on, that's a potential path anyway. Let's okay. leave it at that. Early on. Longleaf seems, from what I'm hearing, because Longleaf can be awesome deer, turkey, quail habitat. Right. I mean, awesome. Right. That's what God put in this area, right? Correct. And that's why I like it so And much, we yeah. read the early explorers, early trappers. Everyone thinks of Lewis and Clark, but there were other early explorers and trappers everywhere in America that kept a journal. Right. Uh, Wide they, enough to drive a wagon through. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or wider even. So, right, yeah. So my gut is with your, and I, and I share the same passion of restoring native habitat. Correct. Because we probably can't do any better for these soils and this rainfall and all those things than native. We just, right. we just can't. Yeah. Much as man thinks they can, they can't. So longleaf seems to be a great fit. And so then the question is, what's the most efficient way to get there? Yes, yeah. that's what we're here today to figure right. out. Right. Okay. Yeah. You just really want to keep. Yeah. You, we would GPS around that, and they can fly pretty good. They can get on out in here if you don't mind. Not at all. Yeah, this little real fine blade right here is annual ryegrass. Yeah, it's like and almost unfortunately, everything out here has been mowed so low you can't tell what it is. Yeah, and it's got to take a herbicide to get rid of that annual ryegrass. Yeah. Let's say uh, weather variables and whatnot, I'm thinking March, March-ish, depending on the winter. Okay. Uh, you're going to need a coat of uh, maybe late March. Uh, glyphosate. A glyphosate, and yeah. then pretty soon after, when it browns up good, we want to drill, because not only is it here now, but it's made a seed bank. Right. And glyphosate's ground neutral, obviously, so we're going to have to get something out competing in that seed bank while it competes a new crop. Now, but let's get to where there's something I think we can get out of ground. We all may have to find something, but see how wide all these roots are? Mm -hmm. And no dirt sticking to them, right? It's just clean. Yeah. That's that's a excellent indicator of very limited bacterial activity in your soil. Okay. Fungal or bacterial. But I'm gonna now that we've seen it, I'm gonna shake some dirt off. See how white that is? Yeah. And no almost no dirt. Right. And I didn't do anything but this. I didn't have to work very hard to get that clean off this. But that can be improved. The soil texture, I mean it's sandy, sandy clay, it's, it's fine. This can be turned around quickly. Okay. This does not, this to me is not near as big a concern as the timber. This okay. is easy. Great. This compared to some of the quote unquote native stuff. Oh, yeah. There's a worm. A worm, and you see the dirt sticking? Yeah. That is a beautiful comparison. So, see how white this kind of looks? See how dirty this looks? Because yeah. it's got dirt sticking to it, right? Yeah. Microbes are going in and out of soil, and you can even tell a difference in the texture of soil. See how that's kind of got clumps? Yeah. And, and That's more po cakey. Pore space in between there, yeah. right? Yeah. Water can infiltrate that, where this is so solid. It's tougher. Smell the difference. Oh, I smell a big difference. Yeah. Can you not smell yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, across the road. Just across the road. Yeah. So, but this has had years of decom decomposition and a, like, within a square foot here, look at the species diversity. Right. And that's feeding lots of families of microbes. So we can turn that, that's, that's easy. That, okay. That's not even, but that is a big. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just try to get my shadow. Look at it, you can see the difference, or I can see the difference. And you got an earthworm right here. And if we had this, you know, entire property, minus food plots and roads and ponds or whatever, cooking with that soil, but you know, we 
had reset the timber clock and had prescribed fire on here for a rotation or two, oh my gosh, how productive it'd be. Right. The potential's here, clearly the potential's here. Yeah. Without adding any fertilizer or lime or any products like that, just fire, natural fire on a rotation. Right. In there. Yeah. I'm not a fan of it. We've got a nice patch of pines, probably 20 plus years old right here. We were thinking, well, can we save these? You know, there's nice, pretty pines. But when I look underneath, there are hundreds of sweet gum stems as we've been looking at. And a lot of them are multi stems. So a skid or some big equipment or something injured those a while back. But sweet gums have tremendous energy of carbohydrates in their root system. Now, Murder's One, I think I remember reading in scientific literature, between 7 and 14 come from Murder's One. You always get more, right? Because mm -hmm. you've injured that growth head and more come up. So I am kind of, I want to serve Bobby, but Bobby's asked me questions. I'm saying, Bobby, if it's me, I'm going to use herbicide to take all those out, which is going to injure or kill a lot of those pines too. Otherwise, I'm in there by hand crew, and I'm spending days doing that when I could be making big progress on many more acres of the property. Mm -hmm. That's, But that's a personal choice, and we're here to create a plan that serves you. I'm just explaining the options. Yeah. So Bobby has my heart. He wants to use natural and restore native habitat. Early on in the day, we're thinking about restoring lonely pine, the native tree here. But to do that, we can't plant a young little bitty seedling lone leaf and out compete a 10, 20 year old tree. No chance. Right. So I think to get to that native habitat you really desire, it's probably gonna mean using artificial means like herbicide to reset it once but after that is all fire, very natural. Mm -hmm. Except if you know you got a patch of Kogan grass or something, we're talking about just backpack spraying or spot treating, not the whole area. We could not have got this detail off a of satellite image. No. So satellite image, I'm just seeing a spot of pines. Bobby says, Grant, I want to leave these pines here. I'm like, okay, that's not a good plan. But here, eye level, boots on the ground. I'm like, Bobby, ho, hold up a little bit, man. There's X thousand sweet gum saplings in there. I would have not got that off a satellite image. So yeah. there's advantages to being boots on the ground. It does cost more, but there are advantages to being here because this is a lifetime commitment for you. You've talked about your children using this place and whatnot. So I think it's better to build the foundation right to start with than to kind of wing it. Agree. You're right. Yeah. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, Moultrie Mobile, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. Six. You got maybe 20 trees in this group. They're not coming here for that. That's not even a load. Right. Hard truth. That's my Christmas present. <laughs> so we're looking into an area here that, you know, had some wind throw. There was a bad windstorm here at Bobby's place a while back, and he was asking, well, how do I clean all that up? And I'm saying, I think that's a change of perception. That's slow-release fertilizer, and those trees are this far south, going to rot fairly quickly. Insects are going to break them down. Decomposers are going to turn that into soil again. So. That's a big budget to get this like a golf course. I'm not sure you really want the golf course look. It's in a state now, like I can tell by that, you see the leaves on there and stuff. That's in a state of breaking down. Now we're gonna use prescribed fire here and that's off the ground. I hope our flame length is not six feet high. So that's not gonna be consumed by fire. But again, just thousands, I guess, of sweet gums out there, bunches of them, not practical on the scale of the size of your property. I mean, if you own five acres, yeah, that's a, a hack and squirt, one guy, take his time, select every tree, leave, don't leave. But on the scale of your property, that's probably a helicopter or a drone and some herbicide to, in your time frame. You know, you mm -hmm. want to get this going for your kids, you want to have it going, so. We were talking about this being kind of clear cut over there versus this cover and where yeah. the deer were going to be yeah. betting. I think on a cool choose. day like today, they're probably out in there and they're, they're in an area that's a little open where the sun's coming down that relatively fresh clear cuts blocking the wind. It's like being in a car, right? 
and it's wicked cold and wind's blowing, but you get the windows up and the sun's shining in there, you're like, whew, it's getting hot in here. Mm -hmm. And so deer are gonna get out in the sun and maybe they warm up as it's gonna do today, maybe get to 50 or something like that. They may come over here where the breeze is blowing through here a little bit, because they don't wanna be melting out there, like we don't wanna stay in that car with the windows up the whole time. So this is not cover. I mean, down where deer lives, it's wide open. It's pool table open. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not cover. But it could be an area deer pass through or use. But it's nothing like what we're going to have in a few years. And it's not, it's not just just a breeze, but it's not swirling. Right. Bobby, we're halfway through. I don't know where we are. And we're on a ridge top, though. And I just mentioned that the wind has been very consistent. And you can feel it, right? It's got right. nice cooling down. It's warming up a little bit. But when we're down the bottom, it... Mm -hmm. And so food plots on these ridge tops may not always be windy, but if there's any wind at all, it's going to be here. And it's going to be pretty consistent going in one direction. So you know where your scent's going. You can make a decision to hunt there or not hunt there. In that bottom area, man, there's a bunch of rubs and scrapes at awesome pinch point. But in that area, the wind's going to swirl. It's probably why all that deer sign is there. And on certain mornings, probably real cold mornings, you know your scent is going down that drain. And you can approach coming up to it. Probably only hunt till 8.30 or 9 until the sun starts making that air warm up and go uphill or there's a really strong front and the wind just keeps pushing down i would develop that for hunting too but no you're only hunting on certain conditions but those days you hunt it can be extremely productive so privet some people know it as chinese privet it's an invasive exotic not from north america Brought in, I think, originally for landscape, if I remember right. Makes a little berry, almost like a cedar tree. Birds eat it, and they fly and can defecate that out and deposit the seed. Uh, deer eat it. They're not too bad. Usually the seed going through the room and maybe not stay in five as much. But uh, massive seed producers, we just saw, or even right here. If we look down right here, I was noticing just down here, all those stems like by your foot. And, mm -hmm. I mean, back in here, that's a moist area, so it was ideal for seed to take hold there. We get a little bit more drier site right up here, which is overtaken by sweet gums. Uh, there's almost no privet in there. In the honeysuckle, we talked earlier, I think, off camera, but honeysuckle, lots of things great food, but it's not. But down low, it can barely make a leaf because the deer just eating as fast as it grows. We get up out of reach of deer. I'm six foot tall again, and that's the leaf size. And then you get back in here, it's, you know, medium size, but out here where it's easy to browse, and it's all over, same all over through here. So deer are hungry. Deer are not gonna make a good living off Japanese honeysuckle. If they're seeking, what do you think? Six and a half feet tall, something like that? They're standing on their hind legs yeah. to eat that. They're not expressing genetic potential because they don't have enough groceries. But we're gonna change that pretty quickly. Man, we've had a great time walking with Bobby. Thanks for having us down, man. And uh, Bobby's got his land here. You're looking over a portion of it here and had some maybe thoughts and theories. And we got here and I think we were able to maybe dispel some of those or maybe put a better path. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Just the wealth of knowledge that you bring to the table that helps me kind of just run a, a, a pros and cons, cost-benefit analysis of the different potential options, at least that I had in my head that you were able to explain, hey, maybe that's not such a great idea and here's why. But that's helped us come up with a path that's yeah. been great. So we've come up with a path. There's a, this was a property that was harvested several years ago. The pines or timber was harvested and then no follow-up. And when you do that anywhere, but especially here in the south, you get the, the species sweet gum pretty dominantly, mm -hmm. different species up north. Uh, and so we have millions of stems of sweet gum. It's not practical to hack and squirt or use a hand treatment to control all that. Um, as everyone knows, I'm not a big fan of herbicides, but they're a tool. And I usually explain it because I think this, everyone can understand, or most adults can, if, you need a root canal, you don't wanna do it, it's expensive and painful, but the doc tells you if you don't do it, that's going to, that infection's gonna spread and rot out some other teeth. Well, this is not gonna get better unless we reset the clock. Bobby has a real goal of not just food plots and deer, but quail and native vegetation and a system that doesn't require herbicide input unless it's spot treating the noxious weed that comes in or something. Mm -hmm. So 
We think that cleaning the table to start with, uh, probably a helicopter application of herbicide, followed up by prescribed fire, not instantly, but over time, and replanting lone leaf pines and native pine species in this area, at a not just a standard eight bait planting, but more of a natural planting, probably work with the Lone Leaf Alliance on this, do some really cool work, and restore that native habitat. Because walking through, Daniel and I were able to spot, and I don't even think we point them all out to Bobby, but a few native species, that seed bank is here. Mm -hmm. And it will respond so well. Almost all those native species are very fire dependent on reproduction. So we're going to set reset the clock, almost like um, a brand new project. And then we need to clean the table so we can start that new project. Mm -hmm. And then plant the desired species. I'm talking lonely pine there. The native grasses and forbs, those seeds are in the soil. Those will be stimulated by fire and maybe low disturbance with planting trees and, you know, just doing stuff, building trails, whatever. Design food plots where appropriate to higher ridges and some of the bottoms, too, and trails to work that so Bobby can approach, hunt, and exit from different directions based on different winds. And and I believe Bobby will share updates with us. So Absolutely. we'll be able to keep you all, because uh, this is, so many people in the southeast have this exact same thing. And to be really candid, you bought this because it's less expensive than a refined project, or you're like Bobby, and he enjoys the process. Right. He wants to see that change and experience it with his family and his two daughters. So anyway, is that a fair summary? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just really looking forward to it. And again, getting over the hump to that clean slate, it, it's a... It gives you, catch your breath for a moment, but it's going to be, I'm just really looking forward to watching it improve and grow yeah. and increasing both value of the habitat and the value of the land Absolutely. at the same time. Yeah. And I think there's a real take home lesson here for you all that are, have recently or thinking about harvesting pines. Don't be that person that says, hey, I'm just going to take the money. I'm basically going to take advantage of the land and do nothing. And native pines will grow back and then I'll get another harvest 20 years. Now that does almost never happens. And when you look behind us, you see the occasional pine, you're probably seeing white or gray. That's all sweet gums encroaching in and shading everything else out. So when you harvest pines, that's a crop. A farmer doesn't harvest a cornfield and just leave it. Mm -hmm. There has to be a follow-up action. And p industrial pines are a crop. And when you're taking that crop off the land, it's really not fair to the land, the environment to just leave it. Yeah. Go, or the deer. Or the deer, or the, or the quail, or the wildlife, mismanaged, or the non-game species. Mm -hmm. You want to manage that. You want to manage after that crop. And in this case, we're going to manage for native vegetation. And in a few years, say five years, I'm still in the number out, a lot of drought and rain and everything that come in here, then Bobby will just be on a rotation of prescribed fire every now and then. Mm -hmm. Really simple management and very enjoyable management. So... Had a great time out here with Bobby. Thank you for trusting us. And we're going to stay involved as we do with all our clients in this plan. And uh, we'll give you updates as we see more progress. And no better way to enjoy the creation than getting it as close to creation had it uh, as it should be. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the creator had the master plan, obviously, right? Super productive game everywhere. Elk and bison in the southeast, of course, whitetails. And thousands upon thousands of Native Americans feeding off that produce. Tens and tens of thousands. Uh, and we're going to restore this portion of Alabama to that native habitat. Yeah. And as we always say, of course, thank you for bringing it up, but you're going to experience a lot. You're going to see new flowers and forbs and grasses that were here, the crater put here. And taking time to enjoy creation, not just getting bogged down in all the work of doing this is important. But even more importantly, Bobby would share this with you also, is really important for all of us every day to be quiet and intentionally seek the Creator's will and apply it to our lives. Thanks for watching, Growing Deer.